Today we are learning and Emma. That's right. Today we're going to be learning about NMR spectroscopy, which is an amazing technique that we are going to use for the rest of this course. So we've already learned about IR. We've learned a little bit about EI mass spec. Although again, we're not going to use EI mass spec in this course. Whereas with IR, we were looking at bonds. In NMR, we're looking at the nuclei in particular. And this helps us understand about the local environment around atoms. We can then use this information to figure out the connectivity of the molecule. Remember last time when we talked about running a reaction? You have your little Erlenmeyer. You use your instrument. You take your pure product, put it in the instrument, and then you get a spectra. You work up the data on a computer and the spectra and the information you need is what we're going to analyze in this course. This NMR is from the UW-Madison NMR facility. This is a 400 megahertz instrument. These NMR instruments create a large external magnetic field on the sample. NMR is available to nuclei that have an odd number of proton and or neutrons in the nucleus. It's dependent upon the magnetic moment of the nucleus as well as the abundance of that nuclei. We're going to be focusing on proton and carbon-13 NMR. These are the most widely used. There are many other NMR active nuclei like I talked about. Again, we won't focus on those. A proton is the most common isotope of hydrogen, and it makes up more than 99% of the hydrogen in the world. Carbon-13 is the NMR active nuclei for carbon, although it's only around 1% of all carbon. Most carbon is, is, is in its carbon-12 form. The differences in natural abundance for the NMR active nuclei for hydrogen or carbon does lend itself to some differences in NMR capability. One small difference is that for a proton NMR, you need even less amount of compound than you would need for a carbon NMR. Here I show the magnetic moments of nuclei in a molecule. As you can see, they are randomly oriented. And this is how you really want to think about the magnetic moments of different atoms in a molecule. This is without an external magnetic field being applied. Once we apply that external magnetic field, there's going to be alignment with or against the magnetic field. There's a slight energy gap between the population of magnetic moments of nuclei that are either aligned with or against the external magnetic field. The trick with NMR is we are going to pulse the sample while it's under this external magnetic field with a radio frequency such that we will have an equal number of nuclei that are aligned with or against the external magnetic field. We can gain a lot of information about the specific nuclei based on what radio frequency the nuclei needed to absorb in order to flip, as well as how long it takes for that nuclei to go back to its original state where we had a small difference in the population of nuclei aligned with and nuclei aligned against. I'm not going to ask you to recreate and to discuss the physics behind this. I just want you to know that the absorbance of this radio frequency is really where we're learning everything we need to know about these nuclei. It's going to tell us information about the nuclei. It will tell us about the local environment of the nuclei, as well as what's bound to it, and also through space interactions. And that's what we're going to be learning. There are three main characteristics of an NMR spectra. The first one is integration. This tells us the ratio of protons between the different signals. The second thing we'll learn about NMR spectra is the chemical shift. Where in the spectra does the signal take place? And we're going to talk about why and how you can predict these chemical shifts. And the last thing we're going to talk about is coupling and splitting and the shape of these signals. This is typically just for proton, and that's what we'll focus on in this course. And this can tell us information about how many protons are on adjacent carbons. So let's look at an NMR spectra. Here we have ethyl bromide. And as you look at the NMR spectra, you're going to notice a couple things. 
you're going to see that there are peaks that are drawn. On the top left of the spectra here, we have this zoomed in. And the reason I know this is zoomed in is because below I have, these are parts per million. And this is the uh, what we'll be working in, parts per million here on the bottom. And here you can see that this signal is around 1.7, and that's also here. So it's just a zoom in. This is so we can see the splitting more easily. The bottom of this, the spectra, we are going to have parts per million. And then you will see the integration. Here, this blue line is showing this signal is being integrated, and it gives us three. Our next signal is integrated, and it gives us around two. This is simply a ratio. What were to happen if you um, had different numbers here for your ratio? Let's say the ratio written was 1 to 1.5. You might find this on spectra. This is simply how we work up the spectra from the instrument on our computer. In this case, since we know we have ethyl bromide and we know we have five hydrogens, we would take the 1 to 1.5 ratio and we would just multiply it by 2. And that would give us the information that we need, that it's two protons for one signal and three protons for the other signal. This is a typical proton NMR spectra that you are going to see. Now, one question you might have is why do we have two signals? When we look at ethyl bromide, we have a CH3 and then we have a CH2 and that CH2 is attached to the bromine. The reason we have more than one signal is because we have more than one type of proton. The reason we have more than one signal is because we have more than one type of proton. So if I were to redraw this ethyl bromide, I have a CH2 that is attached to a methyl and a bromide. We also have a CH3 and this CH3 is attached to a CH2 oops, and a bromide. Notice here that this, the hydrogens on the CH2 have a different environment. They are attached to a carbon directly bound to a bromide. So these two protons will in fact be different than these three protons on the methyl. So in this case we have two sets of protons. We're now going to walk through a way that you can test this, especially for more complicated structures. What we're going to be doing is called the substitution test. Here we have pentane. On the bottom you can see I have the substitution results. We're going to take these two protons and we're going to substitute one of the protons with something else that would um, help us di diagnose this, uh, this set of protons. So we're just going to take a deuterium, for example. If I were to replace one of the protons that I'm looking at here with the deuterium, the, these are the two compounds I would get. What you want to do is replace one of them and ask yourself, what is the relationship? And the relationship here is that we have enantiomers. Here we have S and then here we have R. These are enantiomers. And if you have an enantiomer, when you do the substitution test, these have the same chemical shifts. What that means is that these two protons occur at the same signal. Okay. What about these two protons? Well, if we replace it with deuterium, what's the relationship between these two compounds? Hmm. They are not enantiomers. Look at the connectivity. They are connected differently. These are constitutional isomers. This is a topic from Chem 343. I like to remember constitutional isomers. It starts with a C, so think about they connect differently. That means that these two protons are different, okay? So in this case, we already decided these two protons were the same. So this would be one signal and this signal would be a separate signal. Constitutional isomers, they have different chemical shifts. 
And let's just make sure about these two protons here. What is the relationship here? These are in fact the same compounds. I can take this molecule and I can rotate it, flip it around, and then I'll have that deuterium going back um, into the paper. These are the same. That means it gives the same chemical shift. Okay, so for pentane, how many total signals do we have? We decided that the two protons on the CH2 are the same, and the um, two protons here in the middle are also of the same signal. We know the methyl protons are different. We can see that by connectivity. I'm just going to redraw this. This CH3 is a signal. We know that these two protons are of the same signal. And these two protons have the same signal. So right now, one, two, three. There is a plane of symmetry. And that means that this CH2 is the same as the signal 2 we just denoted, and this CH3 is the same as the signal 1. So we're going to have three signals total. Signal 1 is going to have six protons. Signal 2 is going to have four protons. And signal 3 is going to have two protons. This is how we can use the substitution test to figure out how many signals we're going to see in the proton NMR. Let's look at another example. What about 1,2-dichloroethane? Now would be a great time for you to pause the video and think about how many signals you expect to see with this compound. Okay, we're looking at 1,2-dichloroethane. We could go through and do the substitution test. You can also look at it and see, well, this has a plane of symmetry. And it's because of this symmetry that this CH2 is actually the, has the same chemical environment as the CH2 across the plane of symmetry. Therefore, we're just going to have one signal, and this signal is going to have four protons. Let's look at the spectra. It indeed has one signal, and there's four protons. Again, this is where integration occurs. Does anyone know what this peak is? This is TMS. This is a calibrant that we use in NMR. This is tetramethyl silane. What we do is we add a small amount of this in all of the samples. So you will see this sometimes in the NMRs. And we calibrate it so that signal is always at zero. And it's a way that we can compare all the spectra. This will become more important when we talk about chemical shift. We have an important message from Rody. <coughs> MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging uses the same technology that was first used in NMR spectroscopy. The magnetic field is used to analyze water molecules in the body. MRI was originally called NMRI, but nuclear was removed from its name to avoid patient concerns. Let's do something a little tougher. This can be tricky. We now have a chiral center. How many types of protons does 2-pentanol have? is a chiral compound. How many types of protons? Two, four, six, or eight. Now is a great time for you to stop the video. I want you to do the substitution test on this and figure out how many types of protons we have. Let's do the proton relationship test. The first step here is we are going to replace one of the hydrogens on the methyl. Let's just make sure this methyl is the same. If we replace this with a deuterium, what is the relationship of these two compounds? Well, these two compounds are the same. The CH3 can rotate. It doesn't have an extra chiral center. It still only has the one chiral center, which is here. 
So we know the methyl has one signal. What about this CH2 that's adjacent to the carbon with the chiral center? Let's replace each of the protons with the deuterium. Look what we have here. We created a new chiral center. So here we have one chiral center and here is our second chiral center. What is the relationship between these two compounds? Remember from Chem 343, when you have more than one chiral center and one of them is switched, what do you have? That's right, you have a diastereomer. These will give different chemical shifts. Here we have an SS and here we have an RS conformation. Two diastereomers here. These diastereomers will give different chemical shifts. That means that this hydrogen will have a different signal than this other hydrogen here. Typically, when you have a chiral center, CH2s are diastereotopic protons. So how many total signals do we have for 2-pentanol? Let's look at this. We have one here for the CH3. There's a proton here. We'll say that's the second signal. Don't forget this OH, there's a proton there. That's a third signal. We have diastereotopic protons here. So this would be four and a fifth signal. What about this CH2? Well, this CH2 also has diastereotopic protons, six and seven. And then this methyl is yet another signal. The two methyls are not the same because they're different distances away from the, the OH group. That OH group is going to have an effect on their chemical shift. So in this case, we have eight signals total. So congrats if you picked eight. This was a tough one. It will get easier as we go. All right, we just learned integration and we learned how to pick apart a molecule and decide how many types of protons it would have? How many signals do we expect to see? The next piece of information we're gonna learn is where those signals take place on the spectra. We are gonna be going over the chemical shift. This is important for carbon and proton NMR. It helps you decide what type of carbon and proton. You can kind of get an idea about if it's on an aromatic ring or if it's on an alkyl group and what's bound to it, what's nearby.